lives along the Mississippi River because it facilitates transportation and trade and development of industry along the shore and home sites and commerce. Uh, but then every once in a while, nature comes along and gives us a huge flood or a huge hurricane, and suddenly those levees look like not such a good idea, right? These are, again, three big ways of thinking about nature and society. And I would encourage you to think about this question of invasive species in this, in, with respect to these theories, right? Uh, do, do invasive species fit neatly into any one of these? How do we want to think about the interaction between organisms other than humans, the environments in which they move and reproduce, and the human societies that in some cases um, do these things on purpose, in other cases do them by accident, some cases it works out very nicely and everyone's happy, in other cases it leads to various kinds of disasters. And what is it that makes these dynamics possible? On the one hand, there is a very, very long temporal depth to it, right? Insofar as we're talking about evolution. We're talking about evolutionary timescales at which these organisms become what they are, adapted to a certain environment. On the other hand, it can accelerate and become a very abrupt process if these organisms then relocate to another environment altogether. One to which they are perhaps poorly adapted, perhaps they're well adapted and other organisms aren't well adapted to it. They come without their predators and suddenly find themselves uh, released, so to speak, to reproduce at astronomical rates. And this is what invasive species today are about, and in many ways, um, it's, this is what Crosby's argument is about. Any questions? So Crosby writes, any respectable theory that attempts to explain the European's demographic advance has to provide explanations for at least two phenomena. The first is the demoralization and often the annihilation of the indigenous populations of, of the Neo-Europes. Sorry, that S is missing. Second, we must explain the stunning, even awesome success of European agriculture in the Neo-Europes. The first piece of this is going to wait until next time. That's the ills. The second part here is where the, the weeds and the animals are critical. What is a weed? I think I've mentioned this before. Any plant that spreads rapidly and outcompetes others on disturbed soil. That's a, that's a fairly technical definition. The more general one, which I think I mentioned before, is a weed is a plant out of place. A weed is a plant somewhere we don't want it to be. They are the result of evolutionary adaptations to natural disturbances, such as fire, landslides, droughts, floods, extreme storms, etc. We've talked about disturbances before, I believe. Anything that creates bare ground facilitates not only the spread, but in fact the evolution of weeds. And most of, the weed, most of what we call weeds are plants that colonize bare ground. And they do it before something else comes along to do so. They do it quickly. The receding glaciers following ice ages also favored such adaptations. So if you think here again on very, very long timescales, as glaciers receded from the northern hemisphere, from terrestrial parts of the northern hemisphere, they would leave behind huge areas that had been disturbed, right? The plant cover had been killed and wiped away by the ice and everything that was in the ice, the sand and the gravel and the rocks. And plants that could colonize those newly exposed bare ground areas um, quickly had an evolutionary advantage, right? Crosby says, weeds are not good or bad. They are simply the plants that tempt the botanists to use such anthropomorphic terms as aggressive and opportunistic. And he says, typically, weeds are self-limiting. He says, the only thing that keeps a lid on weeds is their own success. They will move quickly into an area that's been disturbed, and they will establish, and they will flourish there. But they will then essentially give way to other plants, precisely because they will change the conditions. It will no longer be bare ground. The conditions, the habitat conditions on those sites will now have shade, probably greater nutrients as the plants decay. And the conditions will eventually be such that other plants will establish, and the weeds will give way. And this is generally known as succession for ecologists and is well established in many parts of, well, for most systems, there, there are, there's empirical support for this general framework, um, although the dynamics, the larger dynamics, are, are frequently much more complicated. All right, any questions about that? Now, on the face of it, it would seem that Crosby's argument is rather implausible. How can the weeds have been a benefit to the Europeans in the New World, or the Neo-Europes, if the weeds themselves were seen as enemies or as problems, right? Weeds are a scourge if you're a farmer, right? So if you're moving into a new landscape and you're trying to establish farms, Maybe your crops do all right, but if your weeds do really well too, then you've got a problem, right? So it would seem like this is not a very coherent argument for Crosby to be making, that the weeds actually are agents of this ecological imperialism. Cultivation and plowing, the basic practices of domesticated agriculture, are human-caused disturbances of soils and plants to favor for particular plants. So we intentionally plow the soil and plant our crops, and then we intentionally um, cultivate, which is to say, go through and remove the weeds in order that the crop plants can thrive. But in doing these things, we almost invariably produce habitat for weeds, especially where the crop species is an annual plant, right? If the crop species is going to germinate and grow and then die, you are left at the end with nothing but bare ground, which is magnificent habitat for weeds. And this imposes what can rather clumsily be called a kind of inverted artificial selection on or for weedy species as humans struggle to eliminate them and they adapt to survive. And this is perhaps even more importantly the case with germs than it is with plants. But it also is very true with plants. Now what do I mean by this, right? If, if our business is to destroy the weeds, then we are not selecting for the best the way we do with crop plants, right? We're not picking the best ears of corn and replanting those seeds. We are systematically wiping out the weeds that are doing the best, right? The ones that are creating the most problems for us. And in doing that, we are imposing a selective pressure on those weeds, right? The weeds that, for whatever reason, uh, get in our way, our hope is that they won't reproduce. Nonetheless, some of them will reproduce, either because we don't quite get to them or because they're growing slightly off to the sides or something like that. And essentially what you get is, over evolutionary time, you get species that are constantly figuring out how to reproduce in spite of what we're doing. They are finding a way, they are mutating, and being selected precisely for this regime of pest control, weed control, that we're imposing on them. Why does this matter? Why is this important right now, today? Any ideas? Any of you um, concerned about 
artificial fertilizer use. You know, synthetic fertilizer use, yeah. Okay, I've got something else in mind. What's the, yeah, go ahead. Okay, the, pro the, the primary way that we control weeds in agricultural fields in this country today is how? Chemicals, herbicides, chemicals that kill plants by chemical processes, right? If we use those chemicals over and over and over again, which, what kind of weeds are gonna survive? The ones that figure out how to survive in the context of the prevalence of these herbicides, right? In other words, what you get is over time, an artificial selection pressure that essentially guarantees that eventually there will be weeds for which this herbicide does not work. Because you are putting pressure on them to such that the ones that mutate and survive flourish and reproduce. Only the ones that are susceptible to that chemical die, and presumably they decrease over time. The ones that are find some way to resist the chemical um, persist and reproduce. And over time, what you have is a kind of treadmill effect in which the very success of the chemical guarantees the resurgence of the problem further down the road. And all proposals for alternative ways of controlling weeds um, sooner or later come back to this is not going to work in the long run, this is irrational, there, there needs to be a better way to do it. And if you start thinking about vast landscapes that are homogeneous, you know, cropped with the same plants, um, with the same fertilizers and, and pesticides employed, what you are creating is not just this pressure um, in a small, at a small scale, you're creating it at an enormous scale. And if a, a weed species arrives from someplace else or mutates locally that has a, a way of dealing with this, you've got the possibility for a massive spread and outbreak of that weed. And with plants, we might not think that's quite such an issue, but when it comes to crop diseases, it's potentially a, an enormous issue. You can have the same thing going on there, resistance of the organisms, the diseases, to the chemicals being used such that you are essentially creating a new problem on a larger scale down the road. Now, we're gonna talk, after the break, we're gonna watch a couple little YouTube videos about invasive species today. Um, I wanna talk briefly about invasive versus non-native. Are these terms you've heard of before? Non-native plants, non-native animals, invasive plants, invasive animals. Um, they are sometimes used in a way that might lead you to think that they're synonyms, that they essentially mean the same thing or can be used interchangeably. And in some cases, they can be used interchangeably because in some cases, a plant or a pathogen or an animal is both invasive and non-native. But these are not identical categories. They overlap, but they are not the same. There are such things as native invasives, plants or animals that are native to that system but are suddenly behaving differently than before. And there are also non-invasive non-natives. Not every plant that comes in from some other place and therefore is non-native to that place behaves in an invasive fashion, right? Invasive species are a major biodiversity threat worldwide and we'll see that in these YouTube videos in a moment. But it's worth, I think, asking about the anthropomorphism of both of these categories, which is to say they are um, interestingly built around human uh, metaphors, right? Invasion definitely conjures up ideas of being invaded by some kind of outside enemy. Non-native, what does that mean? Would we call people native to North America? Would we call white people native to North America? Okay, let's say we don't call white people na native because they only got here 500 years ago. But we, we know from the Pleistocene overkill hypothesis and the work of paleoecologists that all the other people only got here 15,000 years ago, give or take. Why does that make them native? Well, sure, I mean, it's, it's a convention. It's simply a convention. The, the point is not that somehow one is right and the other is wrong. It's simply that both are essentially um, arbitrary, right? Where, where do you decide, how do you decide where to draw that line in space and time? and say, oh, these, these are native, those are non-native, right? Because we know that these things have all have moved and changed and evolved and mutated. Um, the idea of a naturalized species is a kind, of, a kind of shortcut way of dealing with this problem, right? If something, if some organism, if we, wanna, if we wanna fight back against this invasion, we won't say that it's a naturalized species. We'll say it's non-native, it's invasive, and we're gonna kill it. To say that it's naturalized is to sort of admit defeat and say, oh, well, it's been here, it's kinda gotten used to the place, it's been here so long, it's so widespread, it's naturalized, which means we're just gonna live with it. And it's, it's a little creepy when you start thinking about the way, you know, naturalized plants, naturalized animals, and then of course there's naturalization of humans through various kinds of immigration. You know, for citizens we actually have a formal procedure in which we suddenly say, aha, now you are naturalized. You're a citizen. All right, um, let's take our five minute break. And when we come back, we'll watch some videos and I'll talk a little bit about this place. Okay. <laughs> um, let's get started again. Uh, assuming that you've read the two chapters from Crosby, the punchline here is fairly simple, right? The chapter about weeds describes the amazing, unbelievable, spread of weeds to the neo Europe in the neo Europe, These plants that came from Europe and found themselves in these new places and just went hog wild, so to speak, right? Spread sometimes well ahead of the edge of sort of the frontier settlement, right? And then the next chapter talks about the animals, the pigs and the sheep and the cows and the horses that also spread and flourish in the neo Europe, and in some cases reproduced in sort of astronomical numbers. And Crosby's point is these animals, whether they were tended by humans directly or not so much, moved in and had a great time in these landscapes and reproduced like crazy, which meant that they provided a potential food source and they also radically reorganized the ecosystems they were in. And in many cases, they overgrazed, right? They would reproduce so much that they would exceed the potential supply of forage grass, and you'd get a whole bunch of bare ground, and bingo, you would have the conditions for the weeds. And he even goes so far as to say these weeds actually served a purpose in stabilizing those soils, such that they eroded less than they might have in the absence of these weeds. So you've got a, a, a new system, so to speak, in which the animals and the plants took over and sort of mutually reinforced the conditions for each other. And here, the ways in which animals can eat herbaceous material of almost any kind, I mean, these livestock are incredibly uh, flexible in what they can eat, um, creates a condition in which suddenly you've got a, a, essentially a new landscape. 
one to which native peoples and plants and animals uh, were less well suited, so to speak, than the Europeans. Okay, and there are great, great anecdotes about this. There are particular cases that are remarkably dramatic. And you know, whether you're talking about you know rabbits in Australia or cattle in the Great Plains in the 1860s, there are many, many stories that are like, whoa. And now we're going to see some of these stories as they are playing out today. Okay, we've got about six or seven minutes. Um, any reactions to these videos? They're frightening. What's the most frightening thing about them? Okay. There are frightening risks that these, that these organisms pose. This is stuff going on right now. Buffalo grass, when I moved to Tucson in 1992, buffalo grass was not something you heard very much about. And it is now, as you can see from this video, um, something that even the real estate community is very agitated about. Um, yeah. Okay, Asian carp in the Mississippi River. There are countless examples of stories like this from all over the world. Others? Mistletoe? Yeah. Mistletoe in England. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, yeah. Right, right. It is rather funny to, to look at those people playing golf on that nice green green at Star Pass and listen to the owner or the manager of the Star Pass Resort um, talk about the importance of the environment. Um, there are some deep ironies here. I mean, I would suggest that in addition to the scariness of the actual invasions and the possible implications they have, you know, whether it's the loss of saguaros or whether it's the loss of fisheries in the upper Midwest, um, some of the rhetoric that's being employed is also kind of scary, isn't it? This, you know, procrastination is not an option. We've got to mobilize. I mean, it really sounds very much like sort of you're either with us or you're against us, kind of. The, the discourse surrounding these things can get um, a little bit frightening, especially buffalo grass also, it should be mentioned. Um, it overlies, overlays in really weird ways with um, the human migration issue along the border in southern Arizona. Because basically buffalo grass established in northern Sonora, and in, in actually hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of desert in Sonora, have been bulldozed to plant buffalo grass. Frequently backed by the Mexican government or the state of Sonora, um, at one point actually backed by international development agencies, as a way of creating pasture for livestock in areas that are too low and dry to support native forage. Um, and the, I mean, that's lower and hotter, but the grass, I talked with a geneticist, a, a grass, an expert in grass genetics um, many years ago, Mexican man, and he, he emphasized that buffalo grass can mutate very, very, very quickly, each generation, and that basically it's, it was making its way up a gradient, getting more and more adapted to slightly cooler, slightly wetter conditions, and it was moving north and east up into Arizona, moving across the lower deserts, as we saw in the video, dominated by Saguaro, Sonoran Sonora Desert, um, and eventually making its way to Tucson, which is about 2,500 feet elevation, which is about twice as high an elevation as where it was previously suited. And in other words, the buffalo grass, through, through, simply through mutation, was adapting and was able to move at a rate of potentially many kilometers every year um, up this long, gradual slope into southeastern Arizona. Um, I want to just very quickly give you, give you a few slides here of work, of a place where I've done some work, where the picture is actually very, very different. Um, this is slightly higher. You keep going north and east in this part of the world, and you get higher and higher and higher, and you get to a point at about 3,500 feet elevation and above where the dynamics turn around completely. And in fact, the vegetation is dominated by grass, native grasses. This is a picture of native grass. Um, and fire in these systems actually is an important part of conserving the uh, native vegetation, although there are a bunch of other complicating factors. I just want to give you a quick picture of it. So this is what it looks like in this area um, after there's been a good winter rainy season. This is what it looks like after 15 years of drought. It's not the same site, but it's very nearby. This is maybe 15 kilometers away. And th this, is, this is an area that on average gets about 16 inches of rainfall a year, which is plenty of rainfall to support a nice stand of, of, of grass. But this is what it looked like. And that pre previous picture, this one, is only about a year later. These are the storms that you get in the summertime. If it rains, these huge uh, monsoon systems that are very localized. The point here that I want to stress is that you can get three inches of rain right there, and just over here next to it, it might not rain at all in a given summer storm. This is what most of this area looks like now, a mixture of perennial grasses, which you see in the middle there, and mesquite shrubs. And the mesquite, 50 years ago, mesquite was the buffalo grass of southern Arizona. It was the species everyone was declaring war on. And they were developing ways of spraying it with chemicals from airplanes to try to kill it. And the government spent tons and tons of money trying to set mesquite back. Mesquite is native. But it had in invaded into grasslands as a result of fire suppression, the absence of fire, due both to you know, conscious efforts to put out fires in the name of saving grass and forests, and also overgrazing. Great way to stop fires is to have the livestock come in and eat all the forage. Right? Now, these grasses here are perennial grasses, and they are the object of conservation concern. They are what we are trying to preserve in a lot of these areas, and this is northern Chihuahua. Because without grass, you can ultimately end up with this, these mesquite dune lands, where the mesquites actually send out roots and utilize all the water, and grasses don't have a chance anymore. And in order, if you want to restore and preserve the grasslands, you need to burn the grass such that it will set back the mesquites. If you don't have any grass like this, you can't have a fire, and it's lost. You can't set it back. But if you have some kind of mix like this, there's a chance you can have a fire. 